Hi everyone. Last time we discussed how American society was changing in light of the many new technologies introduced in the late 19th century. Today we want to talk about how people's roles in society were changing during what became known as the Progressive Era. The Progressive Era spanned from about 1880 to 1920 and it was characterized by a host of new reform movements developing across the country. While these reform movements were varied in nature, all of them had largely the same goal, to use the power of the federal government to effect widespread change. While many smaller self-help groups and aid societies had attended to local problems in their communities for many years, by the turn of the 20th century, as a result of rapid urbanization, industrialization, rising immigration, many reformers just could not keep pace with some of the wide-scale problems generated during this industrial age. Thus, progressive reformers began to endorse the notion that the only hope for substantive change was through the power of federal government intervention. Only the federal government had the regulatory reach across state lines to truly address societal ills. Another characteristic of progressive era reformers was their deep faith in science and the power of reason to solve society's ills. They had great confidence in the ability of human beings to analyze, control, and correct their environment. They were certain that humankind possessed the intelligence and innovation to create a better world for all people. If we thought our way into these problems, they reasoned, we should be able to think our way out of them. Many more progressive air reformers were also motivated by a deep piety. In other words, their Christian faith spurred them on in their efforts to make a better world for the masses. The social gospel movement, for instance, a group of reform-minded Protestant ministers, were interested not just in ministering to the spiritual needs of their congregations, but also it believed that it was their duty to assist the downtrodden. It was their duty to try and help out those who were impoverished and to minister to their physical needs as well. And for many African Americans, it was fellow church members that provided much needed assistance and comfort during the period. Even before the Civil War, as slaves struggled to worship in private, they preferred to listen to their own minister's words rather than that of a white preacher as they continued their struggle to gain independence. After the chaos of the Civil War and Reconstruction, in many communities it was the church, again, to which most African Americans in the South turned to. It became a community center of sorts, offering job referrals, child care, and even loans to members to start businesses. And we'll see a number of very interesting voices emerging from the black community after Reconstruction trying to address some of the many institutional problems uh, facing in particular black voters, uh, facing uh, would-be black businessmen and women, and Booker T. Washington will be uh, one of the most powerful uh, voices to emerge during this period. Washington was born into slavery in Virginia in 1856 and as a child worked at a salt furnace However, as he rose into adulthood, he managed to attend school and, when he could, slowly accumulated enough education that he eventually went to college. From that point forward, Washington, convinced of the benefits of education and bettering the lives of his fellow black citizens, went on to found Tuskegee Institute in Alabama in 1881. Tuskegee was a vocational school, meaning that it was a school that designed a curriculum that was narrowly focused on teaching job skills for several high-paying jobs of the day, such as barbering, carpentry, brick making, printing, cabinet making, and the like. Washington's idea was based on the, the notion that blacks needed to develop a strong economic base in order to improve their lives. Then later, once a prosperous black middle class developed, the African American community could then focus on addressing issues such as racism, disfranchisement, and the like. For him, economic self-help was the basis of political self-help later down the road.
As we will see in future lectures, however, uh, there will be other black leaders to emerge around the turn of the 20th century that will have a, a slightly different take on the best route for the black community to better itself. Regarding the rights of African Americans, we have a landmark Supreme Court decision in 1896 in the Plessy v. Ferguson case. The Supreme Court at this time decided that as long as facilities, public facilities, were equal for both races, black and white, that segregated facilities, separate bathrooms, for example, separate railroad cars and the like, did not constitute a violation of the rights of black Americans. The majority decision in the Plessy v. Ferguson case will stand as the legal justification for racial segregation in the South for more than 50 years afterwards. The notion that separate but equal um, will be utilized by Southern segregationists to back up their claims that, 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 as they say, there was no infringement on the rights of black citizens through the use of separate facilities, schools, um, and what have you. This was a major step backwards for civil rights for black Americans during the period. Ida B. Wells, however, will use her voice and use her skills as an educator and a journalist to try and address another issue affecting the African American community at large. The issue of the illegal torture and murder, especially of young black men in the form of lynchings. Wells was a college-educated teacher in Memphis, Tennessee, who eventually decided to become a journalist to highlight the horrors of the abuse that young black men were facing across the nation during this period, at the hands, typically, of angry white mobs. After the murder of a friend at the hands of an angry white mob in Memphis, just because his business was competing a little too successfully with several white-owned businesses nearby, Wells decided to take action. She began to collect data on the number of lynchings across the nation and noted that it was not just a southern phenomenon. Instead, racism was so pervasive throughout the nation that hundreds of young men each year were being exposed to this type of torture and murder. Worse, she discovered that the number of lynchings was rising over time rather than falling. She began to agitate for a federal anti-lynching law aimed at ending this horrific practice. Wells also noted that white racism often took the form in these lynchings, she said, of characterizing black men as rapists, as predatory creatures interested in seducing and raping white women. In fact, she noticed a strong trend in many of the cases that she investigated that it was the mere allegation that a black man had supposedly made a sexual overture towards a white woman. That was enough to incite white mobs to this level of inhuman violence. However, she continued on, noting that sex was actually not the real issue in most of these lynchings. Rather, the real motivation for these murders was economic in nature. Just as her friend in Memphis had lost his life because jealous white business owners resented the competition he offered, so too did many black men lose their lives during this period because they were successful members of their community who challenged the traditional economic and social hierarchy. Despite all of Wells's hard work, however, the problem of lynching continued as Congress consistently refused to pass any anti-lynching legislation to protect black citizens. As a result, around the turn of the 20th century, we're going to see a mass migration of black families from the South to other areas of the industrialized North and Midwest. The so-called Great Migration was a huge demographic shift in American history where between about 1890 and 1910, an estimated quarter of a million black Americans moved from the South to other areas of the country seeking to escape the terrible racial discrimination in the South and also to find good paying industrial employment. Unfortunately, such movement to urban areas like Chicago, Detroit, and New York um, it resulted in a pretty nasty backlash among many white communities and also immigrant communities who were hostile to these newest black residents in their neighborhoods and schools. Again, racism was a nationwide issue during this era, not just endemic in the South. 
One progressive reformer of the period looked at the desperate situation of all city dwellers. In Chicago, her hometown, Jane Adams would end up creating Hull House, a settlement house to help inner city poor with a number of problems that they were facing. Although Adams came from a very wealthy family, she devoted huge sums of her personal wealth towards getting Hull House up and running, especially designed to help out immigrant communities. Those who had recently arrived in Chicago helped them with things like uh, English language classes, low-cost housing, helping them find jobs, helping them settle in to American society. Over the years, Adams and her associates also argued for child labor laws, industrial safety reforms, women's suffrage, and world peace. The problems of overcrowding, poverty, and disease in inner cities also drew in other progressive air reformers to the field. Jacob Rees, who was himself an immigrant to the United States from Denmark, published an eye-opening book of photographs in 1890 entitled How the Other Half Lives. This was a work deliberately designed to show Americans how the other half of American society really lived. The other half, meaning the destitute, the immigrant populations, forced to live in overcrowded slums across the nation. His work was made possible by developments in flash photography during the late 19th century. The ability to go into dark tenant housing with no indoor illumination and be able to use flash photographs to um, illuminate the residents there and the deplorable living conditions, this was something that would have, would have simply been impossible several decades prior. So through his art, his photography, Reese became a progressive reformer interested in showcasing the plight of the poor in the hopes of changing society for the better. Another progressive activist who used his art, in this case the written word, to effect change was author Upton Sinclair. His most famous work, The Jungle, was published in 1906, and it was a novel aimed at exposing the evils of big business run amok, with no regard for the safety of its workers. Sinclair extensively interviewed hundreds of different workers that were laboring in Chicago's meatpacking industry during the period. And he will take these interviews, these real-life scenarios, and, and weave them into, while a fictional narrative in the jungle, uh, still a narrative that was grounded in reality. His work shocked and horrified many Americans, but not for the reasons that he intended. His main focus was on trying to increase work at worker safety in many of these environments. But the American reading public focused instead on the food that was being processed in, these, in this industry. Specifically, the book talked about how some animal carcasses that were brought in for processing were already putrefying, uh, having maggots in them. Uh, they were showing signs of being diseased and dirty and what have you. And many of these workers, under orders from management, were simply continuing to package these things up and send them out for sale to the public. The book also talked about how rats were scurrying about carrying disease in many of these meatpacking facilities, and th this is what really outraged the American public and, in fact, will give impetus to the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act, which will begin to introduce the idea of facilities being visited by federal officials now to be inspected for cleanliness and sanitation. Well, I'm sure by this point that you've noticed several very prominent progressive era reformers have been women, like Jane Addams, Ida B. Wells. What we're seeing during this period is women are beginning to take a much higher profile role in American society than they had previously. So we need to spend some time talking about what has changed with regard to women's roles by the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We'll discuss that in part two of this lecture.